Welcome to the Strong Single and Human podcast, a real look at single parenting, how to navigate the ups and downs of life with kids on your own while keeping sane. We cover all manner of subjects from domestic violence, dealing with childhood trauma, through to fussy eaters and how to help your kids become resilient. I'm your host, Claire Martin. Welcome. This week's guest, Dr. Paul Sambataro, a neurocognitive scientist with the American Academy of Primary Care Psychologists, has created a program called the Emotional Budgeting Program to support the mind's ability to process information and emotions. This program has been clinically tested and has shown successful results in reducing anxiety and stress in children, adolescents and adults within six to eight weeks of daily exercises. The program is based on brain functioning theories and principles for productive functioning and helps organize overwhelming emotions and subsequently improves daily function. As a neurocognitive scientist, Paul has assessed countless numbers of young students devastated by overwhelming anxiety and emotional turmoil, disrupting their ability to problem solve issues in their daily lives and impacting processing speeds and their memory. He has also noted similar issues in adults in private practice, which has led to an understanding that the inability to process and organize information input into the brain creates a sense of anxiety, stress, and the state of being overwhelmed, which limits function. Many adults experience overwhelming anxiety and stress, resulting in emotional pain. Relief for the emotional pain is often sought through ineffective self-medication or self-harming behaviours. This program is designed as a supplemental to a strong therapeutic partnership with a therapist. This is the Strong, Single and Human podcast. Hi, Paul. Hi, welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to be here. I really am. Thank you very much for the invitation. It has been a long time coming between when I initially spoke to you to actually this interview. Well, and I can't wait. I am so excited to speak to you about everything that you've been dealing with and developing over the last, like, well, decades, isn't it? Really been decades. Yes, but not only that, I'm excited to kind of make it a little bit personal. It's uh, something to be part so much in science, but to translate that, and I am hope that we can keep your audience's attention with a little bit of interest and also something that's relevant uh, to themselves and, and others. No, that's cool. That's cool. So look, tell us, first of all, about you and why you created, how you got to create this program called the Emotional Budgeting Program. Well, it it has been a long journey. Uh, It's interesting that it's something been a convoluted trail. But really, if I don't, if it's okay with you, I'm going to start with people that have been, were, uh, they're no longer with me, but uh, they were considered on my part to be really a big part of my life. And that's my grandmother's. So my grandmother, Olga, she was, uh, her heritage is Norwegian, and Scandinavian, and uh, my Nona Dina was from Italy. And both of them had really in those days, uh, they, we're talking about post-World War II, we're talking about times where their support, institutional support was minimal or if anything. And uh, both of them ended up single. One, Nona Dina, because her husband died wow. died at an early age. Uh, she, okay. her, the husband worked in a die factory or, and uh, eventually uh, had cancer. And then um, my grandmother, Olga, unfortunately, she was in, I think, something that might be familiar to a, a lot of women is found themselves in a situation that was a little bit overwhelming. And that meant she had, they had four kids, she was pregnant, but unfortunately her husband, uh, my grandfather, 
it overwhelmed him, obviously, and he left, hopped a train and left for Florida, leaving her with four kids and uh, just like the song, you know, uh, and standing there with and pregnant. And it didn't get any better from there. It was really tough. And I'm just kind of mentioning that because as a man, uh, it always impacted me. And it, you know, I know it's interesting because there are points in which all of this, uh, I was pretty ignorant about anything that had to do with psychology or science or neuroscience or any of that. I knew the picture wasn't right, but I just, you know, you just take it for what it is. You just kind of go on and you don't really, you know, if you don't understand the, everything, then you just kind of think of what the narrative, the story. And of course they had the stories for me. Not so much Nona Dina, which she was you know, Italian and only spoke Italian, but uh, the story of my grandmother, Olga, she had plenty of it. And I was with her for a lot because what happened was uh, my mother was also single pretty much for most of her life, but not because she had to. It was more between my dad and her. Uh, there were actually, uh, um, I can't say mental health issues, but mental health challenges that they didn't know about that I only untangled yeah. later to fit the picture because I always attributed things to the narrative, which was uh, cultural, where we came from or why, you know, we, we make up stories that seem to fit the picture, but in reality, there's more complex biology behind it. And that's where I hope to transition with everyone today. But to understand that I, I have that narrative in my background of women who were severely challenged to survive. Uh, I don't mean just to be lonely, but to actually survive and help the kids survive under them. And that didn't always go well, but you know, they managed. So the family managed, but it was not by any means easy. So the challenge of being strong and being a woman and being single is something I really understand. And my mom lived up to that for me. Interestingly, I pretty much had a lot of things. We didn't have cash, but I pretty much, she was able to give me education, uh, sports, things like that. But I was also left out being vulnerable. And one of those challenges for her or for me that I didn't really understand at the time, other than anxiety and fear, was being left alone like a latchkey kid or uh, being sent away. I probably saw my mom maybe one or two months a year uh, for being sent off oh to places gosh. like when I was six or five to Ireland to be uh, you know, with a nanny or a family that took me in for money or for a little bit, not much. It was poor there in Ireland at that time, which was in the 60s. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and then I had some of the best schooling in the world at the time. Uh, in New Hampshire, it was a beautiful place. It was heaven. And then I went to a private school. But all that time, my mom did rush. She worked hard and she paid for me to go to these places. But it wasn't a family type situation. It was almost like a wealthy kid where you sent yeah. off to private school. And But these, you know, you could write a narrative and a story, but actually there's the challenges. Why, why, why did it happen this way? And she didn't really, my mom didn't really understand. And it could have been easier. It could have been easier for me, not because I actually, I might not have had the things I had, which is ironic, but going back, there are some things that uh, probably was passed on to me that if I had figured out a little earlier, it would have been easier. And I'll, you know, when someone, children hit puberty and go into high school and college, those are really difficult times. And so here I'd like to transition to that understanding and how we can help those of us who are left standing and uh, those are the children to make a, so they're less vulnerable to their environment because really their predators are out there. I, they're, I, it just doesn't mm -hmm. matter. They're everywhere. And we know that because we we have these huge, not maybe personal things that happen to you or I, but just out there. The, the, there's scandals in the church. There's scandals in the Boy Scouts. And maybe not down there, but here in America, we've had them. And uh, they're there. Oh, Maybe. we've had a mirror as well. Don't you worry. There have been yeah. plenty, so, plenty here. And and you trust people and you're, you know. And as a single person, whether it's a dad or mom, you have that, you just don't have that 
teamwork that is there when you're trying to hand off a child to one another, you, you end up trusting. And that's what my mom did. She ended up trusting adults. She wanted to hand me off to people she believed could help me or be with me. Men, uh, you know, she, she did understand that I needed to be around men to kind of grow up away from that. And uh, I do believe in that uh, as something that I grew up around or not having or being with my mom. I kind of get the dynamics of all of that. And it is dynamics. We we don't grow up in a static. Uh, the biology is not static. We are a product of our environment as much as the genetics. We have genetic expression, and those genetic expression are attributable to our environment and situation. Whether it's really high load of anxiety or or stress or trauma or even good times, happy times, those are all important. But as a person who's trying to take care of are my I have, I have children as well, and it's a challenge in this day. Uh, there's a lot of um, downtime. You know, it's not as if the kids have to go to work or work in mines or do any of that stuff anymore. So it's a challenge for them and for us. So here's where looking at it from such a long uh, decades is to not only just look at it, but to try to understand what was, what are we missing? And that's where this is really foundational for everyone to get to the point that one, it's not really work. Once the, once the things have been completed here that we'll discuss a little bit later, the brain will, will deal with it. And that's what's so important because so much is, is about the unconscious brain. So much is about the biology of the brain as an organ not as a conscious uh, process of thought. And we'll get just into a little bit, just to touch on why that happens. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not difficult, but it has taken a long time for me to try and find ways to articulate this. It's articulating so that we can all be on apples and apples and oranges and oranges and so on. Yeah. So, and so your background and what happened to you as a child and things like that, did that actually lead to you then going into more and more research around the effects on um, children and experiences, et cetera, that led to you actually creating this program that you've got? No, actually it didn't because it's so far down the road. Uh, originally I wanted to be oh, a veterinarian. Okay. I, I loved the shows. I was a latchkey kid. It was television. And I watched Doctari. I love Doctari. Doctari was in the States about uh, in Africa, a veterinarian who had a lion who was blind in one eye. And it was just, just this wild animals. And he was taking care of wild animals in Africa. And wow. it wow. just, that is just something from the age of 10, 11. That's just what I thought was, you know, it wasn't appropriate at that. I mean, you know, romantic, but in that age, it was just this kind of, I don't know, something to think about. And so up until about college, after college, uh, it was really at the end of last year of college. And there was a lot of depression in our, I was in wildlife biology program. And there was a lot of depression around the idea that we were struggling as, not as a university or a class per se, but what was happening around us. So back in the seventies, all this climate warming, any of this stuff we see, the 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 um, global devastation of forests and so on, uh, that was all, we all knew that back in the 70s. We all saw it. It was in the classroom. It was in the, and there was no wildlife. It was all management of it. So when I looked around and saw that, I said, well, I, I don't want to leave this because I really, I know I'd love this, but what am I going to do to make a change? What am I going to do to make a difference? I have to, I have to work with people. <laughs> We have, it's people who are men. It's people who are doing this. Yes. So I don't have a choice. I've got to figure out a way to work with people. And from working with people, then that's where the change is going to happen. It's not going to work with an elephant to make a change. It's not going to work with a lion to make the change. It's got to be with people. And it's a long road because people don't change. They don't want to. But why don't they want to change? Or why is it that? And we look around and we just, because we only have an hour here, but I'm going to, just kind of really briefly here, if you go back and look at history, which I was fortunate 
enough to have a lot of history in, in college. I took it. I liked it. But if you go back and look, it, you think, oh, because of this and this and that. But we don't really connect the biology behind our history. And that's where when I got older here, when I started actually working with kids with disabilities, kids with mental health disorders, those are the periphery of our bell system, bell curve. Biology always has a bell curve. You have something that fits, is adapted the best in the moment of the environment. So whatever that environment is, and it's always different somewhere. So your environment there is different than my environment here. Maybe not by much, but it might be the difference between my success or failure and your success and failure. Whether And a lot of people who migrate find better success where they migrate to, or Actually, there's sometimes where they might not. And not to get into too much detail, but we have nonverbal communication, we have culture. And those culture is not is a feedback system, but it's derived from our biology. We create that to provide structure for ourselves. So structure is very important in limiting our choices. And choices are decisions. Decisions is processing. So if you want to make a decision, you have to process the information. You, first, you have to get the information, then you have to process it. So imagine that you're given more and more choices. As anybody who knows has been gone on a backpacking trip or been in the Army or somewhere in the Navy, and you come home, and, and all of a sudden you go shopping or you're taken into a mall, it's overwhelming. You're immediately your senses are overwhelmed. You're overwhelmed with people. You're overwhelmed with things moving. If you have children, you're overwhelmed with children. All that activity is stimulus and data. And all of a sudden, you know, it takes a while because the filters kick in. But imagine if you don't have those filters, you know, and how that noise. And now you're trying to ask people to make situ uh, decisions. So what the brain does is now biology. What it does to do all those things to manage it and it's not always, uh, it's doing it in a way that's not making moral choices or judgment. It's doing it in a biology way, reacting to its environment and immediate, and then sending signals to us, our conscious mind, to say, hey, here's all the data, dumps it in the processing, here, you deal with it. And sometimes when the processing is too much or it's disorganized, then we get a feedback of stress signals and anxiety and, and things. So these are biology, the brain signals that are going back and forth that we don't recognize because or we think we recognize them and we make assumptions. And part of that is we're interpreting it as if it's pain or not pain or maybe a headache or maybe it's high blood pressure, but we're not interpreting the high blood pressure right. Maybe we think we ate something bad. Maybe we did eat something bad. But that high blood pressure also signals the brain to be more reactive in some cases. So what you're saying is there may be things that actually cause us anxiety that we're not actually aware of that our body is trying to tell us, hey, you're, you're stressed, you're anxious about something. Um, is, and, and the information and the data that we're getting back from the world is disorganized because we can't process that process that as such and that's stressing our body yeah so see how complicated it gets already we're we're, we're trying know. to talk apples I'm like, and apples i'm trying to i'm trying to yeah. reaffirm it yeah. back to no, you i'm trying to repeat it exactly. back to you because i'm going am i understanding it, this it, right because it like... is but now try to articulate in all these different variables because the variables are what did you eat is the situation where yeah. Uh, so one of the things that emotional budgeting, as soon as we discuss that, is the part of us that we don't organize or don't think about and let these nonverbal structures do it for us. And that's the part where really it depends on how well our brain is working together and the different parts of it smoothly. So I just threw in another big variable in there, but let's just try to smooth this out a little bit and try to get to the apples and apples. So yes, our brain okay. is sending us signals, but the problem is it's not the signals we interpret 
as uh, like a broken leg or a cut on a hand. And that we're used to because we only have five gauges on us. Well, we probably have more, but let's just say the ones we're used to. Five gauges, like in a car, we have visual. That's our gauge. We see what we're looking for. And all of this is to try and make a picture, fit the picture of what's going on in our world. So we want to make sense. So we want to communicate the data from our uh, what we see back to our unconscious mind that's taking it, and then it's putting it back in our conscious mind, and we're trying to make sense of that. Because what happens if we don't make sense? We get cognitive dissonance, and we go a little bit more crazy every time. So we're making sense, trying to make sense of our world, but we only have visual, auditory, taste, and touch, pretty much, smell. Yeah. All right, so... And then yeah. and so smell. We're maybe. making sense of our world with those uh, cues. However, what happens if something's wrong in the brain? So we don't really know. We make assumptions. And assumptions come along with culture because it's trying to fill in the gap vacuum of making a decision. Making a decision is survival. The brain knows that because it's trying to survive. Everything it does is to survive. The brain yeah. wants you to live. This reptilian yep. brain. It wants you to live because it's making your heart go. It knows your all your functions in your organs. It's getting feedback. Uh, if you're sick, you get a fever because the brain knows. And it's all doing things with hormones and neurotransmitters. It doesn't mean it's working perfectly. It just means that most of us are actually being kept alive because it works pretty well the unconscious organ of our brain is keeping us alive, but it's trying to send signals to and work with the conscious part of us. And our conscious decision-making, the cues we get, we start, make, we start by making assumptions that this is what it is. So if we have a headache, we might think, oh, my spouse gave me a headache because he came back and demanded that I, you know, I, he needed to go to the bar or whatever, you need to go this or that. Or if you're a man, you know, maybe your spouse came back and said, you know, they need to go shopping and you know you don't have enough money. And so the stress is because the brain knows those signals. It's trying to process, problem solve the fact that somebody wants to go spend money and you don't have any. So immediately it sets up a problem. And somewhere in there you have to solve it. Now, most of us do. That's the irony. We do actually solve problems, but it can be overwhelming because it's in an unstructured. Things come in to the brain for processing that we don't realize. So I've just touched on a little bit. I'm trying to speed it around here, but... No, no, uh, no. No, I, I, I it... find it fascinating because it's, cause it's really, right? So it's really... So different people react to, so if I was to say me as an individual, I'm sitting here and I'm taking on board different people's reactions. So I'm seeing their reactions, hearing their reactions. I'm picking up on body language. So what I see in all of those different things, it's how, what I, how they smell, maybe, I don't know, sort of yeah, potentially, yeah. um, you know, exactly. You know, they could be given off a, odor that's not maybe my thing um and um also you know touch they could touch me which is uh, um and make me feel uncomfortable and things like that and so my brain from cultural cues from hereditary like from my parents and things like that and what they've actually passed down from me as such um and what i've learned from my peers and things like that my unconscious brain, my unconscious brain is picking up and then trying to feed this information to my conscious brain. So I then make decisions and judgments and things. Have, 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 have yeah, I got no, it right? You're, you're right. But see how complicated it is, right? <laughs> oh, and okay, we're trying good. to make it and the brain makes it easy because we built up culture to speed along those decision making. So you don't have to but it all ha all of that happens but, really quickly, but, doesn't it? It all now happens we throw like in something else. Yeah. But what actually is happening is the body is reacting at a million miles an hour. So they've clocked. Wow. Quicker than the brain. Oh, uh, by a million mile, miles an hour. So let's the wow. the body is reacting 
at high rates of speed, really, really fast. I mean, really, you're looking at milliseconds. However, milliseconds, yeah, yeah. But when you're milli or trilliseconds, think I don't about know. how long it takes to make a decision. So the brain is actually they've clocked this, the processing, the conscious mind to process a problem takes. Uh, it's only working at some. Something like, and we're talking about bits here because that's the research showed bits like a computer bit and the data amount. But basically, it's like a horse and buggy compared to, say, a rocket ship. That's the problem wow. right there. So the difference is the body has already done some behavior, done whatever it's going to do, and we're actually creating a narrative to explain why it did it. And then we hope to have a narrative back to the body to say, why we should go ahead and try whatever we're going to do, whatever the decision is. We're going to say to the body, okay. And the reason we get by with that is because we build up motor skills or we train the body in a certain way. We do exercises. We, we educate. But you can see how long that takes to help the body yeah. have habits. But unfortunately, once those habits are made. So, so when you say that, well, no, that was what I was going to say. When you say that, it is us actually going – our body reacts, our conscious mind then comes back with a reason. And if that's successful, right, and if that works, we go, oh, that must be how I need to react to that situation then or that, I don't know, scenario. And then we then can, that's our habit, as as you were saying, yeah? Yep, exactly. Except here I'm going to make it more dramatic. Oh, no. Here's the problem. You see a lot of men are violent or they have are violent in a domestic uh, yes, unfortunately. partnership or whatever. Or just violent because we go out and do sports and we're violent in sports. However, the problem here is, is that we see the speed of our behavior, but the brain is now justifying why we did it. So we'll come up with all kinds of good reasons why we were violent. And that's making assumptions. Now we're in the part where we don't really know, but we have to say something, and we look to all kinds of cues that I mentioned, the five of them. Yeah. But that might not be any reason at all. All it might be is high blood pressure. We may have had a sausage when we should have had a salad as a man. Okay, I, I, I'm saying this because I know I have high blood pressure at times for eating the wrong things, coffee, any of that kind of stuff. So I, I, I admit I do react, and I know it, but I, my body will react way faster unless it's trained unless you train it unless you think through it or you apologize a lot afterwards it just you're wrapped up now that doesn't mean everybody so this is a group of people with a physiology that happens now you have another group and i i do have books that later i've been writing but they're not done to describe the evolution of the brain divergency because of this. So we have another group who may not react physically so quickly to that, but internally they have. Internally, they've got tummy aches wow. and they've got all kinds of ailments. Uh, maybe they have other things. And it's an actual adaptation difference in the brain development. Now, we're not going to get into that, obviously, because that's a real science oh my God, it laden is behind all of this. It is, However, but it's... I just wanted to mention it. No, so go on. It's a dramatic difference. Yeah, I was going to say... It's a so... very dramatic difference. So what you're saying is that depending on the different ways that we react to the external world, um, basically uh, can affect us differently? Oh, dramatically. Affect, like illness, like illness or, you know, okay. whether we're Absolutely. apologizing all the time. But... That's why our program really is directed at the organ, because the organ in every single human is exactly the same. It's got to run the liver, kidney, heart, lungs, and it's got to help you walk and eat and talk and survive. And as an organ, because you can go, you can have a heart surgeon work on anybody in the world, and it'll still be a heart. It'll be a human heart. It'll be a human liver. You can have dialysis anywhere in the world. It'll be the same dialysis. Yeah, there may be problems and diseases, and all, but that's that's the whole point of having a medical book and a doctor, because these things about people are the same. However, when we get to mental health, that is a whole different subjective labeling 
variables. And that's why we need to start with a foundation. And that's why this is so important. And I don't mean because I'm saying it personally, but because it's taken me a long time, decades, for all of this, and with my eye on the ball, to make the picture fit, but make it so, at this point, anybody's, uh, just like you would a heart. So if you say, oh, I'm a doctor now, I understand the heart, you pretty do, you much do. You can go do whatever with anybody from Africa to Asia to America to wherever. And, you know, there may be differences of adaptation as far as, you know, um, genetic expression, but basically surgery is surgery on a heart anywhere. And so what we have done with our emotional budgeting is to address exactly how that brain operates as an organ to uptake, to deal with something that's missing in our approach to mental health. And that whole missing thing that actually is not as easy to deal with it because it hasn't, is emotions. It's making it science out of working with emotions. And that working with emotions is awareness, is responsibility, is an understanding, and is a gauge, uh, a rudimentary gauge forensically working backwards from behaviors uh, through relationships and then articulating and sharing or understanding. Uh, and then decisions can be made. Yeah, it's a little bit of a process, but once the brain is uh, filed, once you file these relationships under with that, uh, the brain absorbs this as an organ. And what I mean by that, it puts it literally into a file the same way memories are uptake. Otherwise, the brain will uptake emotions, memories, by uh, not by events, but by the level of intensity of the emotional memory. So all the filing of your memory will be in like a string, like a, a bead string. You know, we can see those television shows where someone's got a bead string of memory and we go back into... Stone Edge or something, and they're all remembering. And well, in a way, that's what the brain does. It, but it's not temporal. So same event, or not same event, excuse me, the the same intensity ten years ago can be literally filed with something that, that happens today. So what is the product of that? Well, it's all dumped into the processing at the same time. It's pulled like a string. All those events. And so if those events are traumatic, we call it PTSD, post-traumatic stress. Uh, because what's happened is a present, uh, an event in the present brings out an event in the past that has similar um, event or similar stress-filled um, uh, emotional intensity. That's what I try to keep that straight. Emotional intensity. So when that emotional intensity comes out, it may not be a big event in the present. Like, but when you pull out, uh, and of course the most, the ones we always know about are war veterans because they've gone through shock and and trauma. But we can also have kids. You know, if they've had a tra traumatic oh, childhood, definitely. or yeah, or e even in the present where there's a traumatic. If, if, if uh, partners have had uh, some kind of domestic violence, that gets in the memory too. And that is also shock. And when it comes out, it could be paired with something that happens that may not be a big event, but there might be some intensity. So it could be a good intensity, but it's still an intensity. That's the problem. So you could have a great event marred by the attachment of the brain to another intense event 10 years ago. Wow. This is why it's so important to file and, and to build files with events and not and separate them out from emotional intensity. And that can be that is what's actually uh, can be done it, because the brain does it. It recognizes it. So we try to avoid that that old. But it's efficient. So how do you how do you file these these emotionally intensive 
situations so that the reaction you're getting, especially with PTSD, the reaction you're getting to minor events that happen but give you the same intensity, um, how, do you, how do you do that so we change it? Well, that's, that's what we, we, now we're gonna get to the nuts and bolts of what we're doing here. And this is why we called it emotional budgeting. Uh, first, the book came out, we now have a course because I added 100 pages of guide step-by-step. Step. Uh, the book is too, not enough information as far as might help an uh, explanation. But the course truly, I, I said, okay, and we have too many, you know, it's just not making sense to other people in the way that, you know, they're wondering how it goes. So 100 pages of step-by-step step into how this works. And the whole point of it is that the brain is an organ. It had, we, we have a lot of variabilities. Uh, let me just add one thing first uh, here. If you're in a classroom and you're a teacher, or you're a student, you notice that about 25 to 35% of the students will track with the teachers teaching that day or a week and they can keep up and it's the right speed. Then you have you know the rest of the percent, you have a group bell curve again, you have a slice in the middle of the bell curve who are tracking and, with the teacher and doing their assignments and keeping up. Then you have one side of the bell curve who are advanced and could be bored and just could be anything. Uh, lots of reasons for the brain not to be sinking, uh, tension, focus. And then you have on the other side of the bell curve who maybe it's too fast, maybe it's too overwhelming. So Again, when I'm talking about the emotional budgeting, there are groups who don't, who get by. They're functional. They're functional enough to be successful. Actually, 15 to 20% of the population is pretty successful. But what we're looking here is to help everybody. Because when we help everybody, we help ourselves. And when we help those who are struggling, that means that we're paying less that we're more functional as a society and we get to do more. So we have a bigger middle class. Yeah. A bigger middle class means more fun and leisure, more time for us to do what we want, more security. When we have 15 to 20% running around, really ruining it for the rest of us, but we can't just throw things at them and say, here, you need to do this and everybody else doesn't. Uh, you know, we have to do this together. So the whole point here with emotional budgeting is sure, it, you may not feel right away that it's, you know, catapulted you into the millionaire's club or, you know, made your family the most successful uh, right away. But I do guarantee, I don't mean I'm going to warranty the whole thing, but uh, with all the variables and all the different things going on. But I, I can say confidentially, like a surgeon who works on a heart, when I'm directing this at the brain, everyone wins. And it's helpful for the people who are struggling because you're a model and you're a person who needs to help be there so that we all can have more time on our hands to do what we want to do or have a more relaxed life. So even if the person I'm addressing right now is functional and doesn't feel they need it, as a society, those who are really smart need it more than the group in the middle. And those at the end, who are struggling need it more. However, it's gonna help us reduce costs, increase mental well-being. So I want everyone to th just try to think it through that way, but it is helpful in the sense of problem solving. So having said all that, uh, this is very foundational. And again, it's the information is about the processing. And because we're all different, I mentioned some of those differences, but it goes way beyond that. And that self-awareness helps with all of those issues, but when you file the information the way I've just discussed with our worksheets, and when those worksheets, what they do is they set you up with relationships, and then from there, uh, the better decision-making abilities. However, so moving on, when we do that, the brain goes, aha, it relaxes, because now when the information comes back out on recall, when you are in demand, when you're somewhere where you've come home from a long day, 
The kids all come out. There are toys on the floor. There are you know, dogs just done something in the back room, and you have to go in there, and all these things going on. I, after a long day, it, it can have people go, gee, I need to go down and have a drink because I'm overwhelmed. I, you know, Or they tee off on their kids or tee off on yeah. their partner. Or they Pretty bury common. themselves away in a room somewhere just to have yep. some downtime and not think yep. about anything. Play loud music, this, do yeah, a myriad of different survival techniques. Because that's what that's I would call them, survival techniques. Yeah, no, exactly. But instead, we have to kind of upgrade our brain because we're not going to make it e This environment's not going to make it easier on us. We're never going to say, oh, let's do some meditation for a couple of days out and leave the kids behind and grandma and grandpa will take care of them. And, you know, let's just cut out the world. Well, that hasn't done a thing to upgrade your brain. That's just cut out the world. And that does, it gives you time to process. And But, you, but your brain doesn't change though, does it? That's the no. thing. Like it, you go it, away it changes, it and you have, up. yeah, you have downtime. You, and so your brain then doesn't think. <laughs> but you, back to, <laughs> so once you're back into it, it all starts yeah. up again. You're back to so square the one. here, we want to upgrade so that we're managing the, the overload of information to be uptake in files, just like a computer, categorized so that when it comes out, we're under pressure or we're lots of information, it comes out better organized. Now, what happens when it's not better organized and everything you see around is going on? I will tell you what happens here in the States, and we can see what happens in Russia or what happens in Ukraine or what happens in the Middle East or around the world. People want structure but they don't really realize it starts at home in the brain. So when their brain is overwhelmed with chaotic information thrown into their brain, uh, there's panic, there's uh, anxiety, there's stress. And then we start to blame those around us because we look at them. Kids, the first thing when they have, if it's, if it's not a pain they can identify even as pain, they look at us as parents and go, you or the teacher, you caused this because I have no other explanation. And this makes sense that you are my fault. And off they go. And when they're teenagers, they're self-medicating. They're asking teenagers what the problems are because their parents have no idea. And nobody has any idea how to explain it other than to say that it's culture or, you know, just mind your manners. And, you know, I'll, you, know you're, you need a belting or something to straighten you up. That's old fashioned, but I don't mean it literally. I'm just saying these are things are how we used to deal with things in the past. And now we're still scratching our heads what to do with. And this is fundamental because we have never dealt with emotions scientifically or systematically, which is scientifically. We have dealt with planning, financial planning for 8,000 years. We scratched how many sheep I had on a clay tablet. And then I said, you can have one of my sheep. And I crossed out that little thing on the clay tablet. I had one sheep left. Then I had another clay tablet said how much I got for it. So I can keep a record. I mean, they literally have those tablets. Samaria or, you know, all these yeah. places, they had records of financial yeah. planning. And not mental health. We have nothing for emotions. The one thing we have for emotions is narrative and that's storytelling. Yeah. But imagine what you do with storytelling. It, it sort of comes in around oranges and apples. It kind of is not systematic. It depends on origin stories. It depends on, oh, everything. So you kind of left to subjective thinking about what emotions mean through books, storytelling, and culture. That's great. It helps you survive. It, it is a short term. But now that we're in the 21st century, it's not enough. It's not a, it's a Star Trek moment. I, I always go back to Star Trek a little bit because it's, it's popular in the States. At Easy, least that's yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah. I think it's and popular globally. It's to me. <laughs> yeah, it's funny to me because one of the main characters is Spock, but it's all about repressing, repression of the emotion. Repression like, of emotions, that's right. It. He's mm -hmm. emotionless. I keep it down and I will not do anything until I have my, you know, mating season, whatever. So the issue is we don't want to repress emotions. We want to 
organize them so when we're recalling them, we can look and make a decision like we do with a budget. So a budget is a line item, expenses in, expenses out. No, we don't make a decision when we're writing up the budget. We make a decision after we've written it out. Yeah. Then we look at it and we review it. We don't make the decision when we do it. And that's really? the same process of why the course and the book is so important because we're not asking you to make a decision or an opinion about what happened, whether you like someone or don't like someone or, you know, like those uh, daisies when you pick, you know, he loves me, he loves me not, you go around the whole flower. It's not like that. It's the facts. You put down what happened uh, in a systematic way and the brain takes it up in a systematic way, it categorizes it, then you can make a decision like a budget. So that's why we call it emotional budgeting. It's not a budgeting the energy or budgeting your emotions so that you have a little bit in one room and you give so much to your mother and you save a little bit for your child and out goes, you know, it's not like that. It's not about budgeting emotions. It's emotional budgeting in the same way that we budget our finances. And I've written, that's the difference in the book and uh, the course. The course is very extensive in explaining all of that. So you come to a point and work through it. So it's about writing down what's coming in and what's going out to be able to process as such. Yeah, well, it, it's about each relationship you have. There's, uh, there's behaviors and you're identifying the behaviors in a systematic way. So there's positive behaviors and there's negative, or there's positive thoughts and negative thoughts. And to just, to be systematic is to, it's, it's, one could think of it as an emotional diary, only it's systematic. So emotional diary would be more like storytelling you tell a story and it may not be true because actually, yeah, I've had a rubbish day. It's because of this, blah, blah, blah. It was great here. It was, yeah. but it's a story of your day. A lot of assumptions. That's right. Yeah. But a lot of assumptions are made because when kids feel bad, they may be depressed, but don't really understand that. And so they lash out in their diaries. So it's kind of a, it, the problem with a diary, emotional diary or writing a diary, if you're, depressed or have issues or bullying or any one, of that, but yeah. all yeah. of it comes out negative, but it doesn't help to solve then, the problems a lot of but, times. And so I'm going to say- But it's also, like you said, right, it all comes out negative, right? But there might be quite a bit of positive in that person's life. But if they're depressed or they're just focusing on one thing- No, absolutely. That's why we have the difference. We have positive and negative systematic identification of your behaviors. So what happens when everyone is doing the same thing, the, the daughter or the child or the son or the mother or the husband or the spouse, if they're able to do it simultaneously or at some time in which they can actually look at the perspective of that person who within the relationship. So there's two of you. So if it's a mother and a son, the son fills out that about his feelings or his perspective of the facts of his behaviors and mom's behaviors and the attributes. Then the mom fills that out about the son. And if there's an issue or they feel that, you know, they want to increase the communication. And this is another subject I really wanted to touch on real quick, but if they want to understand what's going on between the two and increase the communication for, especially for the mom, a single mom, from my experience, this is, a huge tool because now you can actually see how the perspective of the child is and how your perspective is and address that as a problem solving or, you know, however they want to work that. But yeah. now you can see apples and apples. When I say uh, some of my experiences, probably the biggest issue is was communication, not understanding the apples and apples communication from me to my mom and my mom to me, because she had some of those challenges of articulating those emotions. So here's a chance to write the facts of the relationship from each person's point of view, and then address the issues. Because 
If you try to address those issues without that, and trust me, I did a lot of that with me and my mom, it didn't turn out right. We escalated. Now, part of that was exactly what I was saying with, uh, you know, the understanding of the lack of emotions. And my physiology and her physiology, we escalated. So we didn't really, I mean, we only exhausted ourselves to a point of relief is what happened. Sounds like me and my son. <laughs> and that's not that's not a good that's not a balanced or no. good way of no, dealing it's with not. it. I promise you, no. it took me a long it time. Escalates, it took my mom. escalates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, to get away I, agree, with it, I agree with you. So you have to change that state, don't you? Facts. Write the facts down of the behaviors and attributes, and it's not easy. I I thought it was easy until I actually the whole concept. But when I actually went to do it. Can you give me an example of that? Can you give me an example of that? Like, how would you, if if you were in a, I don't know, if you were having a communication issue, uh, I'm trying to think of one off the top of my head. Like, say, for example, sake, um, you needed your son to empty the dishwasher, nope, say. That's the wrong, wrong way to look, start. You're already behind the curve at that point. Well, there we go. You have to do this. This is a preparation of the brain. You, If you start behind already, you're behind the eight ball. There's different ways to deal with that already. And I, I, that's a long process to say, oh, how do I fix this? Well, how you fix this is exactly what I'm saying. You sit him down. There's two most important things, I think, with the child from my perspective and that I feel is one is, and this is from being a school psychologist, because one uh, you had a lot of differing authorities and missions between everybody. The parents had one idea what they wanted their son to do. The son had some other idea, and the teachers and everybody. And the school will yeah, do. Yeah, it it's just yeah. a big mess. So most important thing is for the aha, aha moment for the child in the sense that you're helping him draw a picture that fits. And one way to do that as a parent is not to dismiss their feeling bad. Their behavior is bad. We get that. Uh, I'm all about not supporting bad behavior, but it's understanding bad behavior. So the point is, is to not dismiss that, but say, hey, you know what? We're a team here. We're going to work with you. And I don't know the solution. I really don't. But you know what? We're going to get a solution. I don't know who I'm going to talk to. I don't know the support system, but we're going to figure it out together. It doesn't have to say, you don't have to say a solution. You just have to say you're going to work it out together. It's the dismissal that sends the kids running to their peer groups. It's the, and then it's a loss of authority because now you're saying. So no validation of them. So it's saying your, your opinion and who you are doesn't count. I'm telling you, you need to do this. Well, I, I wouldn't that's... have articulated exactly, but that's how most of us start out with. But I change it to, you know what, You're, the behavior, it's not going to work. But you know what, there's something behind it. And we're going to get down to it. And we're going to figure it out, whether you have to go to a doctor. Maybe you have a headache. Maybe there's some pain. But you know what, we're going to figure it out. But... The tool I'm saying here to figure it out is put down the facts of the relationship only between you and your son, nobody else. You've got to put those facts down. Okay. And you, what you do is you take just a random set of things that are good about each other, a random set of things that annoy you about each other. He does his thing. You do your thing. You put down your behaviors. And there are consequences of those behaviors. So what's the result of all of this, right? So then you get to that. But you do it for a specific thing, line item. So like in a budget, we don't set, put lump. Well, we can. We can actually lump a bunch of things together. But let's just say most of us take apart, and we take it apart by saying, okay, uh, we have an expense for television. We have an expense for purchase of um, movies. We have an expense for clothes. We have an expense for education. We separate out all those things. That's what we need to do to detail the facts in a, in a relationship. So we, by doing that, the way we do it is just to mark down, we have a set number. We use five for positive and five for negative in our book and in our program. And then we can do a cross, just like you would if you're budget planning, but you use the facts 
in a relationship, the behaviors, the actions, the responses. Not the emotions. No, those are made up afterwards. This is what causes the emotions. It's, it, it's facts. It, isn't that interesting? That's exactly why it's not easy. Um, why there's a kind of immediate jump to emotions, but actually those emotions are made by biology uh, uh, actions in the brain. So it, it's not grabbed out of thin air. It's it's sort of like, okay, here I have a an apple, but actually uh, molecules and, and atoms make up the apple. And while that's really not that important until you're trying to solve a problem, like mm, food, you know, saving food or cooking food, then those things kind of come into play if you're really trying to, you know, analyze it. And stuff. Yeah. Same thing with emotions. It's not a problem if you don't have a problem. But as soon as it is a problem, it's the success of financial planning and the way it's done should be a clue that we want the same success for our emotions or for relationships. And that's exactly what we're doing. But we can't do it without work. I mean, we can. Uh, it's like I said, you know, 25% of the people are 35 because of their physiology, uh, because of their great processing, or maybe they're just their environment. It's not challenging, and they don't have the stimulus that the pressure that you know makes all of us go crazy. It could be anything, but for the human brain, on average, it's important that we separate and label and identify because this is what's going in the memory. Remember. This is the crucial point of why we're doing it. So the memory uptakes it in an organized fashion. And then when your son, and, and if he does it too, if, he, if he's doing the book, it's going to be an amazing, uh, uh, it's like the, an awareness without realizing there's an awareness. It, I'll never hear that this was ever working because the brain has this weird way of, when it takes it up in a biological way, in, a, in an unconscious way, it just assumes that it did it on its own. And that's great because actually the relationship just kind of magically unfolds. Uh, I have a lot of clinic examples that I would love to share, but I'm not going to share them now because it, it would take another story to explain as an example why that is. But I've seen it so many times. Uh, it just it, it's, it's almost like a miracle because there's, there's nothing to point to it. There's no gauge. There's no gauge in the head that said, oh, this is what this did, and we can attribute. It doesn't work like that. We just kind of, and, and then the brain says, oh, I did it. And so you get this kind of cooperation, communication that just unfolds itself, but there's no arrows pointing anywhere because we don't see the arrows. We, we, don't, we can't feel the arrows. We can't, we just assume what those arrows are coming from because of our senses. But when they're internal, you know, there could be anything. So I'm saying this is what it generates. It generates this incredible sense of awareness. And as soon as the awareness happens, uh, relief for the parents a little bit, for themselves, because now you're working towards problem solving. But for the children, maturing responsibility. Because self-awareness, responsibility comes with that self-awareness. If a person is bad and has bad behavior, they don't recognize it as bad behavior. They're recognizing it as a sense of, you made me do this. You caused me to make my behavior. And in a way, they're right, because you're a million miles an hour body reaction. That's why I was, here it comes, a million miles an hour. Now here comes, and this is easily, especially easy to see with children, because you see, oh, the vase is broken, and now they're saying they're making up a story. And you're saying, oh, oh, you liar, you liar, liar, it didn't happen that way. But what they're doing is they're trying to make the picture fit what happened. Their body reacted, they did something, and now they're trying to make like it, it was okay because it, it, it all makes sense. But actually that just devolves into growing up with cognitive dissonance that can turn deadly or abusive or not good functionally. So in other words, not an optimum function to succeed in life. And we're prepping the brain 
so that the brain is optimized, sending less anxiety signals, able to process, make problems better, and between mom and son or daughter, share apples and apples and perspectives without the escalation. So this is which is really yes. important, isn't it? It's really, that, really important that we share apples and apples and it's not apples and pears or apples and oranges or apples and pineapples or whatever. It has to be an apples and apples situation right. for there to be a solution right. because, because you can't solve apples and pears. Well, because they're looking at it from the sense they're justifying their behavior from their five senses. They see you, they did it, but it's not their fault because you made them do it. Oh, we grow out of that, or we're supposed to grow out of it. But you see, in politics, it doesn't grow out no. of it. We we have politics. I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, <laughs> I'm not exactly. sure we do grow out of it. I'm not sure we do grow out of it. Even if, even if you believe you are like um, emotionally um, intelligent, for want of a better word, emotionally intelligent with all of those things. I sh I'm sure there's still an element that sneaks in there every now and again that you just catch yourself and like pull that all away. So look, Paul, the this this is what you teach within the emotional budgeting program. That's right. Isn't the course it? Is, this is that you you actually yes. step by step deal and with this is, in the and course. And I have don't video you? as well as the reading so that we double down on the uptake of that information. But is it it's so much the foundation to then the decision making is do we need to go to a, a doctor do we need to go to a psychiatrist do we need, need to go to a psychologist but when you do go to those people you have a sheet of facts you have something you can present to them or the child can together and this empowers not only the parent because now you're working with the child and they see that and they're, they're looking at you, the per person and the parent, as an authority figure. So when you go to the doctor, psychologist, or counselor, you don't lose that sense of, oh, now the counselor has control. Now the psychologist is taking over. That might be a relief. And I know it happens easily because it's a relief to hand off the issue. But we can't do that with our children. We have to say we're there with you. We don't understand it, or we don't know all the answers, or if they need medicine, which is a high possibility, at least it will be understood and looked at as a behavior as a baseline. Because if the behavior changes, you guys can both go back and look at what the baseline of behaviors were, uh, whether they were bad or good, or and, and they get better. Um, you know, it, what is the solution? Are the solutions working? What are options? And this is what prevents children from thinking about suicide, because they have options. Yeah. Suicide is just another way of saying, this is my problem solving solution in this moment, because they're not, they don't have the facts. They're going off their senses. Exactly. Exactly. I agree with you. They just see it as their only option, right? Exactly. Which it isn't. Exactly. It isn't no. their only option. But, to get but they to that, haven't, yeah, they haven't got the get skills to, to actually, to have the facts. yeah. Mm -hmm. Get yeah. the facts like a budget. So let me give you an example about a budget. So if we had, okay. say I make $6,000, but I spent $8,000, but I didn't write it down. Okay, I might remember some of the big bills, but I actually forget a lot of the little bills. I actually, yeah. I'm gonna admit, I do up. speak out. Mm -hmm. And when it gets close, uh, and there's a little bill from an internet reoccurring bill, those are the worst. Uh, I freak out because I can't remember where the reoccurring bill happened, right? And then they come in annually, they come in monthly, and they just come in where you really don't mark them down. And all of a sudden, you got $100 going out, and you, you don't know where the heck you can't remember it, right? That's the same as what happens when it's not organized, your blood pressure goes up, your the anxiety rockets, the stress happens. But once, if you write that down and you're prepared, you can cross it off before it happens. You can, when it does happen, you say, oh yeah, you know what? That's really dinged us this month, but you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go back in and cancel it. It's simple things like that because now you're in control again because you know the information. It's when they don't know the information, you don't know where emotions are coming from, that it all gets to be a big chaotic mess.
uh, I say Gordian knot. It's like a big Gordian knot in the brain. And it trying to unravel that during the processing under pressure to come up with a solution of some sort. And it could be something completely different. So let's say you go to work and you had an, uh, an issue with your sister or the kids. That's going to come out under pressure at work trying to solve that problem. And it makes it hugely difficult. This is why high school and students, it's so important that what I'm saying here, it's not going to go over easy as to say, oh yeah, we're going to do this, you know, da, da, da. No, but I wish I had it during high school. I know it would have helped me personally huge to oh, understand. I wish I'd had it in, in high school as well. It's just, there's so much, there's so much that goes on at that age um emotions hormones looking at how other people are who look as though they're holding it together but they're probably not um and various different other influences and you're right you have to at that stage have somebody help you bring it back to the facts the reality and not the emotional side of things well we know that the emotions are going to happen but then with the awareness we know why the emotions yes. but as it importantly, is. we know that now the behavior is connected to that emotional issue with that relationship. So all relationships are different. That's why we encourage, uh, you know, doing it multiple times with, uh, we call them circles, uh, you know, close, third parties, and then further away. Uh, and we lay it out in a very systematic way because by doing that, you're not denying the emotion. The emotion is there. We feel, we want to feel, we want to have that emotion, but we're now aware of why it happened. And if we're aware, we're responsible because when we have to, now we can make a decision. Do we avoid this? Do we, what options are there to deal with this? Do we need to go to a doctor? Do I need to change or do they, are they doing something wrong? Or how about if I talk to my mom and we'll share and we'll see, maybe we can come up with a solution together. That's the parental can do that much greater than the child could, but the child will have that facts as well. That doesn't mean that everything is perfect. It just means that you have apples and apples and that it can be communicated with instead of, as I experienced growing up, a lot of escalation. And that wasn't because I love my mom. She loved me. That and that's the weird thing. And it's just this communication. It's just this apples and apples and feelings and emotions come out first. Uh, my biggest issue problem has always been that, uh, you know, the children always want to have their feeling. They want, especially the daughters, they want to have that emotion. They love that emotion feeling. And I don't mean to make a stereotype out of that but the issue is is that later we're in touch with our emotions us women us you men yeah, who are a bit exactly. scary exactly but if we understand why and what behaviors are associated with it all of a sudden it makes sense we're not denying the emotion we're not saying we don't want it we're saying oh we're aware of it so we can have better and i think yeah more positive. and i think that point is really important what you said right we're not denying or hiding and and like and covering up an emotion, right? Because that really is bad for us. But what we're doing is we're sitting in that emotion and we're going, well, what? why am I feeling like that? What are the facts behind this emotion? And it's about sitting and, ed and, and, and educating our children to sit in uncomfortable emotions, right? Take a minute, don't react, don't punch or don't... Um, run away or any of the different reactions that you may have to an emotion, but just actually go, well, I'm just going to do nothing and sit and try. God, it's hard, but sit and try to understand and work through, well, what are the facts? Yep. Um, you know, what am I dealing and, with? And once you do that with your child, uh, someone who's not going to run away or, you know, or, or I mean, you know, who's, who's going to be there with you, uh, you only it only needs to happen once until they change or somebody changes or with friends. Uh, it just needs to be done once with a friend. But if there's a new person in one's life, that's important. 
then it should be done. Because once you do it, the brain understands. It, it categorizes that person for a long time, years in the brain as is. If you don't do that, you leave it to the organ, the brain as an organ, to do whatever it usually does, which is to put it in its own method. And that own method results under pressure. It, it, it's great when there's no pressure, and it's great when there's no environmental stress or problem solving that needs to be done right away. Like uh, 100 years ago or 200, 300 years ago, if I was a sheep herder, that was pretty nothing out there. I was herding sheep and I had to make sure somebody didn't, you know, a wolf didn't eat it or, you know, wasn't stolen. That was it. That was it. That's been our history. That's our genetic makeup. Not much except war, you know? So now we have to upgrade our brain. We need to do something that changes to upgrade, to handle. Otherwise, we're going to get all these things that we see. We get all these pressures, the same thing that happened in Rome. You get all these pressures. You get all this kind of political uh, nastiness because you have a lot of anxiety, unstructured information. If it's not coming in structured, is chaos. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad. If, if you just pile it in. And you see that with groups of, it's easier to see with kids with disability. That's why I started to understand it, because you see it more plain. You see the reaction quicker. You see the overwhelmed, uh, the kids' response and behaviors get worse, faster, less resilient, more vulnerable, quicker. And that's why you get to see it in much faster time. If you just sit there and it's like bird watching. It takes a long time to sort out the different patterns, but with children with disabilities and vulnerabilities, it happens on a very rapid cycle. And so you get to see these patterns. And under my, what I really appreciate is that as a school psychologist, I did a lot of cognitive assessments. I got to see the differences in the brain associated with behaviors and the children's thinking. And the greatest feeling about that was when I explained how their brain worked, the differences, Everybody's is a little bit different, and this and that, and uh, it can make a difference about how a child reacts behaviorally if they don't know. Because when they knew how their brain and why they felt the way they did, it was an amazing amount that helped them calm down. Uh, parents didn't always appreciate me being forthright about their children's uh, cognitive assessments, trying to explain to them how they thought. I don't know why, but it was... It was more, I think, because there's a sense of control over the child. And when you're handing them independence of awareness, but the irony of that is when they're more aware, they're more responsible. It's sort of like, a, you know, it's, it's sort of not intuitive to explain to a child to help them make, be more aware, they're actually become more responsible. Uh, but to make them more aware, you have to have information and a cognitive assessment helps to explain to them to make sense because they can't see their brain. When you come in and they you have some authority and they have some trust with you and you say, I took this test, you took it, here's what happened, here's how your brain works. This is why you have these moments of pain or anguish or anything because there's things happening with your brain. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, there was a long time problem with uh, a student. She had um, the, the parents were going kind of, you know, a little bit bonkers, trying to figure it out. No one understood. But as soon as I did the cognitive assessment, an auditory weakness came up. And I mean auditory processing. She was a very smart child in all areas, but she didn't understand. She couldn't figure out why she was struggling. And so fortunately, I did, I knew better, but I did the assessment with a audio portion. Some of them don't have it, so you would have never known if you just did the one without the audio. But you had to put the audio, and that revealed a striking deficit in audio processing to the point where it was so different from the rest of her uh, thinking. But it was to the point where she, it was can be resolved by it through, and they took her to, you know, real expert uh, neuro psychologists and did more tests and and there's good medicine to help with that actually because there's some of it has to do with neurotransmitters or other things and anyway the point is it wasn't so much that she was cured but what she calmed down so much because 
everyone was working together to help solve her issue. And that calmed her down. Otherwise, she was a total mess. She was almost... Well, otherwise, she wouldn't know. She, she Nobody was... knows what's wrong. So if you don't label something, you just don't know what it is you need to right, fix. Right, in the brain. So, again, it goes down to yeah. those senses we have. We don't have gauges for the neurotransmitters and the swelling and the, all kinds of variables going on in the brain. The hormones, we have no idea, except by behavior. Yeah. What the heck? Don't even talk to me about hormones, yeah. but yeah. No, but there's so many things mean. going on. So... So, Paul, where can people look at and get this program? Where are where is your program? Okay. Well, the good news is I'm all over the map. If they just look up my name, Paul Sambataro, uh, uh, Dr. Paul Sambataro, PhD. So do a search on Google for your name. It brings up a lot of things. But the program is uh, the link. The, the key here is because the link is a little awkward. It, it's uh, put on YouTube, uh, Houston Behavioral Health Institute on YouTube. It's um, okay. on our website. I can post the link in the blurb. I can post the link in yeah. the blurb. So that's okay. okay. So And and go yeah. from there. The, okay. publish, right. the books are published. No, cool. They're not as detailed. It's not a step-by-step -step guide in the books. And that... The course helps people That's more, what I. That's it? why I, I took some time here and I realized that it, it just... I needed to not... You know, I could have helped explain, but obviously it's time and money and people. So the course does exactly that. It's a step-by-step -step explanation and then takes you through it. And the issue here is, I hope everyone really understands, it's not. It's going to be this incredible, it's not going to be this like a, um, like a Buddha wakes up under the lotus tree and all of a sudden he's done nirvana or something, you know. It, it's not quite like that. The results are amazing, but the brain doesn't think like that when it happens. But what happens in the results is this kind of, you know, working with other people in those relationships that you've noted as priorities, especially if you can have the other person do it as well. And in that moment, it's apple to apples. And it doesn't mean that everybody's going to be like, Oh, you know, uh, all of a sudden, I understand why you're so important to me. And, you know, it could be that there's too many negatives in there. And because it comes down to choices, it increases the ability to make a choice. But the awareness says, if you make that choice and you decide you have options, you know what you are, your choices are, so you're responsible for doing that action for that decision. We have to own up to it. So if we say, oh, okay, you're really, you know what, you're you're just not good. And you can't do that with children, right? So it's really good to make sure that you're all on the same page because children, you're gonna be stuck with your parents till you're 18, hopefully, in a good way. Well, hopefully the whole of their lives. Yeah, no, but, you know, you know I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, let's hope that this works Absolutely. all out and goes from but there. with other people, and other relationships, you do get to say, I want to avoid you. So this is important with kids in school. If there's bullies, it's very important Definitely. to not just, you know, have those emotions, but understand where they're coming from, then seek out support to help make a good decision about what to do with that situation. Instead of looking at mom as she's the fault because you have these feelings and emotions that started at school with somebody you didn't like or didn't like you. And that's why it's so important to have these children and students do this, because it also helps to make sure that there are problem-solving solutions and that they're looking to the parent as an authority, not running to their peer groups because mom and dad don't have time and dismiss what they're doing, even when they don't have answers. It's okay not to have answers. We don't have answers. But collaborative, apples and apples will get us to where we can say, hey, you know what? There's an issue, we're gonna do it together. I don't have the answers, but we're gonna get the answers. I don't know how long it's gonna be, maybe we can do it as faster, but I understand it's hurting. Yeah. Okay? Yes, it's just, it's just recognizing that. Look, Paul, thank you so much for coming and speaking to us about all of this. It fascinates me. Um, I love anything to do with the brain and like how we actually can improve the ways that we communicate. Because at the end of the day, I feel like the world 
has so many labels for so many different people. And really, at the end of the day, we need one. And that's to label us all human beings, right? right? We're all human beings. We're all trying to get through this as best we can. And actually to develop this understanding and dealing with facts and not emotions, we might actually get a bit further as a race. I hope so. And <laughs> I'm not counting on it. destroy ourselves. Exactly. But that's the point. Yeah. That's the hippie yeah. in me <laughs> no, anyway. That's, but, you know. That's what we need to so, do. So, you know, exactly, exactly. But look, thank you for joining us and taking time. I've been, try <laughs> been trying to work out getting this interview sorted with you for ages. So, um, yeah, look, I... I hope to speak to you again about this i'd love to delve into various different other aspects as well uh going forward so you know maybe if you're free we'll get you back on to talk about some of the other stuff that you've been dealing with always free it's up to you guys i really appreciate being here and i really appreciate your audience I, it's something i just really uh you know it's personal with me in a lot of ways and as i mentioned in the beginning here so um, uh, I'm very appreciative to be able to say something for your audience and, and let them know that we do have uh, solutions, but it takes all of us, even if some are doing better than others, we got to kind of make sure everyone comes up with a bootstrap so we're all safe and we all succeed. So yeah. that's my uh, yeah. goal too. Thank you. No, it's been a pleasure having you on, Paul. Thank you. Okay, really appreciate it. Anytime you, I, I'm free most of my time, so... Just let me know. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this podcast and you would like to hear more, please hit subscribe wherever you like to hear podcasts. If you would like to support us further, share this episode with your friends and family. And finally, drop us a review on iTunes as I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments and ideas. It all helps me to understand and produce awesome content you want to hear just like this. If you want to check out our past episodes, write to us, appear on the podcast, or for links, resources, and show notes, go to our website, www.strongsingleandhuman.com. We are also on all the usual social media platforms, Insta, Facey and Twitter. I hope you have a wonderful week and I hope to see you back here again soon. Be kind to yourself and remember, no one is perfect. We're all just putting one foot in front of the other and doing our best. I'm Claire Martin and you've been listening to the Strong, Single and Human podcast. podcast.